Can I have your attention, please? Sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. Settle down, please, thank you. So many of you have asked me how to get the COVID test done. There actually is a box right outside the main entrance. Thank you, thank you, sorry, thank you. Please. Okay, so there's a COVID testing center right outside the main entrance of this building. So when you came here on Monday to register, or on Sunday night, I don't know when you got registered, you must have come through the main entrance. Right there is a small thing known as a Google box or COVID testing center. It costs um, about five euros to get tested for a rapid antigen test. PCR tests are free of cost. So it's highly recommended that you all get one done. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please come and ask me. You need your photo ID with you. So it's five euros, photo ID. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, let's start this uh, second session with uh, Juan Maldacena, who will tell us about looking at supersymmetric black holes for a long time. Yeah, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this uh, wonderful meeting and also for inviting me to speak at it. So uh, this work is based on, I will report on these two papers that we wrote with Henry Ling, Lisa Rosenberg, and Chiru Shan. Um, we as a field have been looking at supersymmetric black, extremal black holes for a very long time. Um, so their entropies beautifully match with index computations, and we had yesterday a wonderful talk by Luca um, showing how that happens. Uh, so what more could we say? Um, now, there are many questions that remain. Uh, for me, I think, well, first of all, there is more to the black hole than its entropy. In particular, there is an ADS2 near horizon geometry, and one would like to understand how that uh, ADS2 near horizon geometry is encoded in the quantum theory. Or another way to ask this question is whether there is a quantum mechanical dual to ADS2. Um, now, one message of this talk, and if you don't remember anything else, um, the idea is that uh, there, are, there is more information, there are correlation functions. And, and that's what mainly this talk will be about, exploring them. Our main technical results involve computing some of them uh, in the so-called disk approximation, so where you neglect uh, higher topologies. Now, you might ask, haven't been pe people been computing ADS correlators uh, basically forever? Um, and the answer is yes. So we understand a lot about ADS correlators with dimensions in dimensions bigger than two. But in two dimensions, the situation is a bit harder. And it has been only understood within the last few years. Um, now, the new feature is that there is a gravitational mode that becomes strongly coupled, even for very large, uh, naively semi-classical black holes. Um, so let's uh, just remind you about that, and let's talk about extremal uh, black holes. So uh, we're considering charged black holes. Uh, their, their masses should be bigger than the charge, and the extremal limit is when the mass uh, becomes similar, well, very close to the charge. And in that limit, the black hole, which might be, let's say, in asymptotically flat space, develops a very long throat. Um, and the black hole has some size. Uh, there is the, the size of the throat. And the, the long throat has a near horizon geometry, which is ADS2 times S2. Uh, there is a very small redshift factor here. Um, and as we lower the temperature, the throat becomes deeper in the sense that the, uh, it's longer, and also the redshift factor becomes uh, smaller and smaller. Um, now, uh, it, it, when you calculate the classical action of uh, these geometries, let's say the finite temperature geometry, as the temperature goes to zero, uh, you find that the free energy or the classical action becomes independent of the temperature. On the other hand, the geometry, as I just told you, becomes longer and longer. So the geometries are very distinguishable. On the other hand, their action is almost uh, indistinguishable. And so that means that there is, uh, there is a flat direction developing in the, in the action. And we need to really, we cannot treat it classically. We need to integrate over this flat direction. Um, and now, uh, the mode, this flat direction corresponds to essentially to the length of this road. And you can think of that as, uh, from the point of view of ADS2, as a mode that lives at the boundary of ADS2. Uh, from the full geometry would be a mode that lives in the region that joins the ADS2 with the higher dimensional uh, space. And it's telling us how long the throat is. Um, so, 
And this mode becomes uh, highly, highly quantum mechanical at low temperatures, and so we need to treat it exactly. And in recent years, it was understood how to treat it exactly. So I'll now remind you of some results uh, that come from quantizing this boundary mode and computing uh, the partition function, including the quantum mechanics of this theory, of this uh, particular uh, mode. Uh, and the results depend on whether you have pure gravity or supergravity, as in any, when you quantize, it, it really matters whether you have fermions or not. Um, and in the non-supersymmetric case, and this is the same transparency essentially that Luca showed yesterday, in the non-supersymmetric case, the density of states, or uh, the entropy if you wish, which classically would go to a constant at low temp low energies, in, once you take into account that quantum mechanics, the entropy actually uh, goes to zero. Okay. So that's uh, the result of quantizing these modes. Uh, in, the non -super in the supersymmetric case, with enough supersymmetry, uh, with a total of two or four supercharges, then uh, you find that um, there, is actually, there are actually some states that sit exactly at zero energy. Uh, with a large degeneracy, this whole curve is multiplied by a factor of e to the S0. So S0, you can think of it as the extremal entropy. Uh, and then there is a continuum, and interestingly, this uh, continuum uh, is separated by some gap. Um, and this gap is uh, set, you can think of the energy of this gap as being essentially the temperature at which um, the classical action becomes of order one. Okay, so that, that's the temperature at which you need to really include this quantum mechanics of this mode. And as, as compared to the usual parameters of the four-dimensional black hole, for example. Um, so one over Re would be a typical energy scale of a gravity mode of order, wavelength of order the size of the black hole. This is down by a power of uh, the extremal entropy. That's, these are relations that are valid for just rising and ostrom black holes. Um, so that tells you what the energy of the gap is, and this comes from uh, solving exactly the theory that governs the quantum mechanics of this uh, gravity mode, which uh, has some, Schwarz, some particular Schwarzian action and so on, and we're not going to uh, write it very explicitly. Um, now, one thing that uh, this uh, tells us is that if we go to energy smaller than this gap, then we have a clean low energy limit, right? So we can take this system and then take a clean low energy limit, and at this very low energy limit, uh, only the ground states survive. So if you look at a supersymmetric black hole for a long, let's say, Euclidean time, then only these ground states survive, and in this theory, the Hamiltonian is exactly zero. We have a theory uh, with no boundary time, uh, theory with, uh, or, or you could say it's a theory with time reparameterization symmetry. Uh, now, what happens with the bulk uh, in this limit? So, from the boundary point of view, it looks like something strange is happening. And from the bulk point of view, it's interesting, because from the point of view of the outside observer, in this limit, you have zero Hamiltonian, you have no time. On the other hand, the observer in the interior says uh, he or she still has some time. Okay? Uh, lives in a Lorentzian manifold deep inside the throat and uh, there is some time for that observer. So it's a, an interesting setup to understand the, the emergence of these bulk times. Um, now, why do we study the particular case of supersymmetric black holes? Well, I said the limit is conceptually clearer with supersymmetry, but we'll see we have also some similar features without supersymmetry, but they are slightly harder to state. So we'll stick for the super, with the supersymmetric case for now. Now, which are examples uh, of supersymmetric black holes for which this discussion arises? Uh, well, they should be uh, black holes, uh, for example, in flat space that have an ADS2 near horizon geometry with non-zero area, and those ones uh, typically have n equal to four supersymmetry, uh, four supercharges, and there is one that has n equal to two supercharges, uh, which is, arises as a black hole in ADS5 times S5. So these are some concrete examples uh, for which the discussion we're going to have uh, would apply. So we will start by uh, looking at the two-sided black hole or two-sided uh, wormhole, Schwarzschild wormhole, well, near extremal wormhole, rice nordstrom wormhole. Um, so in this case, uh, we have uh, two boundaries, and the uh, basic variable of this two-sided problem is the distance uh, between these two boundaries. Um, and that's a gauge invariant observable in gravity, and you can find that the uh, action, the effective action for that this comes from the Einstein action uh, is, uh, has this form, so it has a form of a Lubel theory, and 
So in this case, the mechanics of the L mode is first you start with a very long L, you can become shorter and then becomes bigger again. And that uh, gives you the usual features of the Schwarzschild wormhole. Now with supersymmetry, you basically get the same as this, except that with some fermionic partners of L. Okay? Um, and so this is uh, the full Lagrangian. Uh, you don't need to know all the details. Uh, what's important is that uh, there are some extra Yukawa terms involving the fermions. And depending on the state uh, of these fermions and of this extra scalar that is related to the um, gauge field associated to the U1R symmetry. So depending on the state of these fields, uh, so these fields you can think of um, uh, forming, com combining into qubits, and depending on the state of these qubits, uh, the effective coupling in front of the E to the minus L over 2 term uh, could be positive or negative in principle, but it has the possibility of being negative. And if it is negative, then the full potential uh, has, uh, would have this, uh, has this form, so a form where it it's uh, negative at long L and then becomes positive, which is dominated by just the usual uh, term that we have even in the bosonic theory. So we, we see here clearly that with supersymmetry we can have, uh, in principle, some bound states. And in fact, uh, when we work this out with the precise coefficients uh, that are determined by the supersymmetry, you find that you have actually uh, only one uh, zero energy uh, normalizable ground state. Um, and this ground state has a localized uh, wave function in L, and uh, so L uh, has so some kind of uh, typical value. L is not grown. We have a worm Remember, L is the length has the physical interpretation as the length of a wormhole. So this wormhole has a fixed size. It's time independent. We have zero energy, and uh, and the, the news, the, the important point here is that this length is finite, right? And this is different than the uh, naive classical picture where as you take the low energy limit, the length becomes infinite. Remember in the beginning of the talk, we were talking about the length becoming infinite in the naive classical approximation. So now we see once the quantum effects are taken into account, the length is actually finite. Now let me emphasize this last point by asking a slightly different question. So imagine you have two supersymmetric black holes and you ask whether there is a, a wormhole uh, that connects them, right? So usually wormholes are discussed for, uh, um, for configurations with finite temperature. Let's say we take the zero temperature limit. Uh, is there a supersymmetric wormhole configuration? And uh, the answer is uh, yes. And in fact, is that normalizable ground state that we discussed is uh, one example. Okay, so one example of a supersymmetric wormhole um, is supersymmetric in the sense that from the boundary theory point of view, this uh, zero energy states preserves uh, the supersymmetries on both sides. Okay, so once we have that ground state, we could uh, calculate uh, two point functions. So we have one operator on one side, one operator on the other side. It, uh, field, massive field propagating between these two uh, with some, uh, the mass related to the dimension. And uh, we do this integral, we get uh, some uh, finite answer, okay? So the two point functions uh, at this uh, very, um, we're discussing here the extremely low temperature limit, the zero temperature limit, it becomes uh, just a constant that depends purely on the dimension of this operator. Um, and then it has the usual e to the s zero factor that comes from being at this amplitude. So this computation, which is a gravity computation, uh, has uh, an interpretation in some uh, in the boundary theory. We have an interpretation as taking the UV operators O, which might be just the measurement of the value of some field, um, and then projecting onto uh, the zero energy uh, ground states. So P. Uh, comes from evolving with an infinite time, uh, evolving the, with the Hamiltonian an infinite, with an infinite time, and this projects purely on the zero energy ground states. Um, now, so we, one can compute those uh, coefficients c. I'm not uh, showing you the formula, uh, but I will show you a comparison uh, with uh, some explicit quantum mechanical theory, which uh, is governed at the low, low energies by the same uh, supersymmetric action we were talking about before. And that quantum mechanical theory is the n equal to 2 SUSY SYK model, which is similar to the ordinary SYK model in the sense that the supercharge is determined, uh, well, it's written in terms of complex fermions, in terms of some random uh, couplings. And then uh, the Hamiltonian is constructed in this way. In this case, uh, these um, zero, there, there are actually uh, three zero energy ground states, so it's slightly different than the discussion I was talking about before, but it's a minor difference. And 
In this case, now you can compute this zero energy uh, correlation functions uh, in any of these states, and um, you have the sh prediction from the Schwarzian, and then you can do an exact diagonalization calculation where uh, you get, uh, well, some numerical answers for 16 fermions, and they, they already, for a relatively small number like 16, they are already matching pretty well. Um, okay. Um, now, we discussed the zero energy uh, two point functions, but one can uh, further compute the two point functions at all times. And uh, the computation is similar to, is conceptually similar to the computation that was done previously for the non supersymmetric cases. So at very short times, uh, you have the usual conformal answer that goes like one over u to the 2 delta, u is the time difference between these two operators. And at very long times, you go to the constant that uh, we were talking about before. Okay? So they go to some constant values. And the transition uh, time at which uh, they go from one, so from this behavior to the constant behavior is uh, one over this energy gap that we were uh, talking about before. Okay, so uh, let's discuss some implications of this constant value for the two-point function. Um, so imagine that, um, well, first of all, yeah. So imagine that we diagonalize this uh, Hermitian operator O, which could correspond to, again, as I said, the measurement of the value of the field. We diagonalize, to be more explicit, we diagonalize the operator after we project it to the zero energy ground states, okay? No, we are not done diagonalize the UV operator, we diagonalize the infrared operator as the, after it's being projected to zero energy. And then the express just from the expected expression for, well, the, just from the formula for the correlator from its uh, quantum mechanical interpretation, we find that this two-point function, the normalized two-point function, is just simply the average of the eigenvalues of this operator, okay, of the infrared operator. So that is a very uh, trivial relationship. Um, but it, we are just simply saying that this two-point function gives us the typical eigenvalue of the operator, okay? Um, now, these typical eigenvalues have, uh, so, well, I, I didn't emphasize that point, maybe go, I will go back here. Uh, this constant value of the two-point function is, um, so if you normalize the operator this way at short, short distances, then this constant value uh, has the form, at least for rational Nostrum black hole, of one over the entropy to the two delta. So it's small uh, for large black holes, um, but it's small by a power of the entropy, not by uh, an exponential in the entropy. So we can still use the disk approximation to compute it. Um, and we can interpret that small value as coming from the fact that the, mass, the field has to travel from the near, from the outside region where we are normalizing the, operate, the operator, two, the two-point function to one, to some region deeper inside this throat uh, at some distance that is uh, the logarithm of this entropy, okay? So the field travels for some distance, which is the logarithm, and that gives this uh, suppression. It's just the usual propagation of a massive field over some distance d. Um, so that gives the, the, the suppression factor. And so we can think of, so I, I mentioned that the length uh, between the two sides was finite. Uh, so once you uh, put in the various constants that appear in this calculation, that finite value is actually equal for rising from black hole to uh, basically the logarithm of the extremal entropy. So that's the distance between the two throats uh, in this uh, thermophile level state. Um, now, the fact that uh, the eigenvalues have, uh, the, the, well, these, these values are pressed by the entropy, uh, tell us that if we uh, are considering uh, various microstates, so the typical microstate should have some structure in the sense that uh, it should differ from state by state by an order one amount uh, at a distance which is from the boundary, which is of order the logarithm of this, uh, of this quantity. Okay? So, if you uh, imagine that the, the microstate should have some gravity description or semi-gravity description, some de bulk description, let's say, uh, then uh, they ought to be all the same uh, up to this distance, and then they should differ essentially at this distance um, from each other. They should have over their one differences, at least as seen by this operator. There might be some other operators where you don't see the differences, but for a simple gravity operator that corresponds to the measurement of some simple field, uh, 
in the outside, it should uh, have order one differences. And notice that when people discuss uh, gravity description of microstates, uh, they are implicitly thinking about diagonalizing precisely these values of the fields, the values of the gravity fields measured in this region. Um, so now we turn to higher point functions, and uh, we'll explain some of the details of the final answer, and we'll give more details later. But the idea is that you can construct these higher point functions from two blocks, two elements. One is an ADS to Witten diagram computed uh, in the same way that uh, higher dimensional diagrams are computed by extrapolating the bulk fields, and then um, and then adding uh, the boundary propagator. So let's recall how that worked in the non-supersymmetric case. Um, so uh, the, blue, the blue represents just the Witten diagram where you take the bulk fields and you take them close to the boundary. Um, and then uh, you need to add uh, the propagator of the boundary particles that depends on the proper length of these curves and they depend on these bulk points. And then you integrate over all the bulk points. Okay, and in this way, you include the exactly, so the important point is that these propagators treat the quantum mechanics of the boundary particle exactly, so you get a result which is, treats that uh, boundary um, quantum mechanical excitation exactly. And then the dependence on the boundary times comes through the dependence of these propagators on this distance, on the, on the boundary distance. Now, a supersymmetric case is the same. Uh, as usual with supersymmetry, there are some extra Grassmann variables. That's a technical detail. Uh, but the final formula is somewhat similar. There is a piece that comes from the uh, bulk uh, Witten diagram, now with some superspace variables. Uh, and then uh, there is a piece that comes from the boundary propagator. But the important point is that this zero energy limit of the boundary propagator is independent of the boundary times. Only depends on the bulk times. And these bulk times are all integrated over. So in the, at the end, uh, you get something which is independent of these times. It's just some number. And this number is e to the s naught times some function of the uh, couplings uh, of, of, of the couplings in the bulk and also the dimensions of the theory. Okay, and you can think of this as uh, in the bulk uh, in the boundary dual. Uh, they would be the trace of some matrices, and these matrices are simply the projection of the UV operator onto the zero energy ground states. So that's the uh, boundary the, the boundary interpretation. And in the bulk, uh, these uh, projected operators can be viewed as essentially an insertion of a field and then some propagator over a very long Euclidean time. So let's discuss some applications of these formulas. So you could compute, uh, for example, four-point functions. And there are two uh, bulk diagrams that you could consider, uh, the one called time order correlator and the out-of-time order correlator. And these two are uh, somewhat similar for dimensions of order one, uh, while for dimensions that are relatively large, uh, then this one is more suppressed. And you can estimate this for large dimensions by a certain classical um, approximation or saddle point approximation to the integral that uh, we see in this transparency. Now, I should emphasize that what this formula does is it reduces the, um, the calculation, which is a functional integral over all possible boundary trajectories, to a finite dimensional integral. So that's uh, the expression for the correlator. Uh, anyway, so knowing that four-point function, we can uh, understand some features of the following uh, states. So we have discussed uh, previously the empty wormhole, so the thermophile double state. We can add some matter in the middle, and this operator could be anything. And after we wall for a long time here, we get again another wormhole, which is also a zero energy wormhole, uh, and is also supersymmetric. Despite the fact that this matter could be uh, arbitrarily, if it's not BPS and it could be a non-supersymmetric uh, particle and so on, uh, we could have a mess here in the interior, but uh, we still uh, get a supersymmetric state. Um, and we can calculate the length uh, of this wormhole after we put in some matter. And we can do that by considering a four-point function of this operator and a very tiny oper operator with very tiny dimension. And if you do that, then we can calculate the extra length. And that's of order uh, to, well, it, as we increase the dimension of this operator, that length uh, increases. Okay. Now, similarly, we can uh, calculate the density matrix on one side. So uh, if we don't have any matter, we have the identity density matrix in the zero energy ground state. But if we uh, add matter, then uh, we have a density matrix that we get by 
<coughs> tracing out this uh, left side. Uh, and then by, we can take various powers. We are, we're always working in the disk approximation, and then we get various diagrams. Um, <clears throat> I, I've drawn here a planar diagram of contractions between all the insertions of these operators, and the, these are the ones that dominate when the operator has large dimension. Um, and in fact, uh, you can deduce from here uh, what the structure of the density matrix is, what the distribution of eigenvalues, and also the distribution of eigenvalues of the operator itself. Um, and it's a Gaussian uh, random matrix uh, with the usual semicircle oper uh, distribution for the operator. Um, so um, now this says that the entropy uh, is um, the entropy is some uh, S naught minus some number, uh, which is actually independent of lambda. Now the entropy is an order one number, and so in the limit that S naught goes to infinity, we have this type one algebra, uh, which also featured in uh, Wittenstock. So it appears also in this system in a in an explicit way. Um, now uh, I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Um, well, I'll skip, maybe I'll, well, yeah, let's jump to the conclusion. So we have extre extremal black holes offer us an interesting laboratory to study the emergence of the bulk theory. Uh, correlation functions are an interesting observables. It's the first step to study in this bulk theory. And uh, it's crucial to take into account the quantum mechanics of the boundary mode in any discussion of the extremal uh, microstates. Uh, so we obtained uh, the full two-point function, we found an integral expression for the endpoint function, and we explored the eigenvalue distributions of infrared operators at low energies. And all of these are constraints for any candidate description of uh, the microstates. And I think it would be nice to have a better understanding of the emergence of the bulk time in this limit. Thank you. Questions, comments? Uh, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, uh, I have a naive question about uh, the effective potential that yes. you had for the yes. wormhole throat. Apparently, uh, at uh, large lengths of the wormhole throat, the effective potential uh, reaches zero uh, from the negative side. Yes. So, a uh, zero energy uh, particle in such a potential would classically execute unbounded motion. Uh, yes. So, yes. I was wondering how uh, you get a uh, localized bound state uh, in such a case. Yeah, so it has the, the there is an attractive well, right? And then that's yeah. why you get uh, the the zero energy ground state. And it turns out that all the continuum modes have some energy uh, with a particular energy gap on top of the ground state. Um, it basically comes fr uh, from that uh, a a dot term that I see. gives a tiny I see. energy gap. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, could, could you comment on the Lorentzian structure of these correlation functions? They were all Euclidean so far. Correct? Yes, they, they were all Euclidean. So if you consider the Lorentzian two-point function, so you can analytically continue, and it also goes to a constant um, at long times. Now, it's important that this constant is real. So if you consider, for example, taking a Lorentzian black hole and perturbing it a little bit, um, the effect of the perturbation dies out at long times because the effects of the perturbation, is, well, at least the wave of the field after you made the perturbation, is proportional to the commutator. And the commutator is related to the imaginary part. And uh, so... Do they exhibit any oscillatory behavior in uh, Lorentzian signature? Yes, in, in Lorentzian signature, because of this gap, they exhibit some oscillatory behavior, but yeah, it's, it's what you expect from that feature. Um, Does the theory below the gap um, have operators in it that exchange the degenerate ground states? Yes, yes. So presumably, all the, when you act with these operators, that you will modify the ground state you're you're in. And but they're not part of your description here. No, right? they are part. So well, when you act with these operators, you you will be. So when you take these infrared operators we were talking about, yeah. when you have projected them, uh, then they are they're acting on the ground states and they're exchanging from one ground state to another. So 
Um, so the complexity of the theory is uh, of, let's say, even this co-ladies to geometry is in the structure of these operators. So you have these operators, which are the simple operators in the UE theory. They become some particular matrices in this uh, n by n, well, e to the s naught times e to the s naught uh, space. And um, so all these uh, correlators uh, depend on the structure of the ADS bulk, and they are just acting on the ground states. Um, yes? Very nice talk. So if you take a, con a specific example of these uh, uh, supersymmetric black holes, typically the ground state is some kind of uh, cohomologies and some moduli space and so on. So this operator that you're talking about will be, as you were just mentioning, some operator acting on this space. Exactly. Uh, is there a sense in which you can actually see what it is? For example, we know, uh, you know, we know a concrete example. In a specific example, what is this operator acting on these cohomology classes? And do you have as many of these operators as cohomology elements? Uh, and how do you envision seeing yes, them in the yes, box? Yes. Well, yeah, you, you, you have a huge number of operators, in principle more than, uh, than, than, than that, those elements. Um, and you can overfill the black hole by acting with many operators uh, and so on. Um, but we don't have an explicit way to, of seeing what they are. So this is not a BPS. Uh, I mean, the, the, it acts on the BPS states, but uh, we don't have an explicit description of these operators. We can say some of their properties. We can uh, calculate, for example, the distribution of eigenvalues. So, for example, in the case of the, this, this SYK model that I was mentioning, the UV operator is very simple. It has some eigenvalues which are plus or minus one. Once you do this Euclidean evolution, you get some more complicated, complex operators with a whole uh, distribution of eigenvalues, which is a random Gaussian matrix with a very dense uh, spectrum of eigenvalues. Yeah, so for example, the value of the eigenvalues, could they be the degrees of cohomologies in, in this, that you're looking at the distribution of them when you're talking about it? It just seems like there should be something natural on the other side to compare with, right? Um, well, I, I expect that, that it should be complicated. There should be some measure of chaos in these operators, which uh, makes these operators be in a comp relatively complicated random matrix with eigenvalue repulsion and so on. I, I don't expect them to be something simple in terms of the cohomology. I, I might be wrong, but... Uh, that's thank you. Yeah. I think we're out of time, so let's thank the point. Yeah.